Good morning. Okay, so Pirashat Pirashit, as we said, is a tall order. Pirashat Pirashit is uh, obviously secret of secrets. It's the, the more you know Pirashit, the more you realize that you don't know anything about Pirashit. It's about the creation of the world. So um, we'll try a couple of things to uh, maybe clarify it from what I've read. But definitely what I don't know vastly outweighs what I know about Pirashat Pirashit. There's no doubt. I don't think it's a coincidence that we start the Torah right after some hot Torah with only two days to prepare because you can't understand anyway, so just get it over with and move on. <laughs> Don't forget, not everyone in history finished the Torah on Simcha Torah. Simcha Torah was a new invention in the rabbis. It's Shemini Aseret. But we have a cycle, and we intentionally finish the Torah on Simcha Torah, on Shemini Aseret, which is why we call it Simcha Torah. And there are a couple of reasons they give for this. One reason is because the Kafahim brings down a reason. In other words, everyone understands what I'm saying, right? The Torah has a, a yearly annual cycle, right? We could have started it whenever we wanted. We could start the Torah and finish it on Hanukkah if we want. Or Shavuot makes a lot of sense, right? Why don't we start it and finish it on some hot Torah? So there's a reason for this. Now, number one, it wasn't always the case that it was annual. Because the Gemara says very clearly, Benema Araba. When the Talmud Babli says, the people in the West, he's talking about Israel, Israelis. You have the Talmud Babli, the Babylonian Talmud, and Talmud Yerushalmi, the Jerusalem Talmud. Sometimes the Babylonian Talmud talks about those Israelis. So they say, they used to finish it in three years. The Torah was a three year cycle for them. So every Pirasha we had, imagine it was a third of the size. Much more time to sit and understand everything, right? Three years they finished the Torah. So for us, now it became custom that we all finish in one year. But there's a reason Bedafka that we do it now. Kafahim brings one reason. Hashem says, the holidays, if you have a job now, you know how crazy these holidays, I mean, they wreck your whole thing. Every other day is a holiday, right? So the Kafahim brings down a reason and he says, Hashem doesn't want us to start the new cycle and get interrupted by a holiday, Sukkot, Homeland, this. We want to start fresh when we know we're going to be able to read without interruption from holidays. So we did not start the sheet now. There's no holidays until Hanukkah. And Hanukkah is, is not even biblical. It's from the rabbi. Before that, there was no Hanukkah. So the whole winter would be a nice, you know, smooth rotation of, of holidays. But I, I don't think it's a coincidence that we do the sheet now. There's no time to understand it. But I'll give you a couple of things. Number one. Most, if you see the actual Torah scroll, you'll see that on the, almost every single page of the Torah, the top letter is, someone knows this, right? Almost every page of the Torah, almost every page of the Torah, if you go to the Torah, the top letter is almost every time the same. It's a Vav. Vav, 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 Vayet, Vayom. It's always a Vav. Vav means and. It's a continuation. The Torah is a cycle. Which is why in Bezot HaBedachah, the day that we finish it, we start brand new with, with the new ones. Which is why when we finish Tehillim, we do Ashrei Ha'ish right over and start beginning. We never finish in Judaism. The job is never done. There's only five times in the Torah where you won't see a Vav on the top of the page. This is one of them. Bereshit. The Bet. Not a Vav. Right? There's a Yod for Yehuda. When Yaakov blesses the tribe, the Yod of Yehuda is on the top of the page. It's an exception. There's a Sheen. After the Ejel, there's a Sheen. There's a hay when they split the sea, Habaim, when we're saying the Muslim were chasing them. And there's a Mem for Bil'am's blessing, the famous Matobo, Ohalecha Yaakov. That Mem is on top of the page one. So it's only five times from all the pages of the Torah. And there's tons of pages in the Torah that it's not a Vav. Every other time it's a Vav, which is show us that it's never ending. It's and, 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 and. And that's what our Torah is all about. Now, when you get into Bereshit, it's like you open the Torah, what is going on here? It's very confusing. We have angels, we have creations, and there's a lot of places where you can trip up here and have tons of questions. Not even trip up, have real questions, like, you know, normal questions that you don't have answers to. There's some things we just don't understand about Bereshit. But there's something very important that the Gemara tells us. The Gemara Sanhedrin tells us the following. Yemana says, 
You should learn a lot of Torah. You have to know what to answer a heretic when it comes to convince you of an atheist. You have to know what to answer. Missionary, you have to know what to answer them. This rabbi argues and he says, you have to know what to answer a non-Jewish missionary when they come to Antioch. But a Jewish, a person who was religious and they threw it all off and they went to atheism, they know everything. So anything you throw at them is just going to enforce their beliefs. So you're wasting your time. But a non-Jewish heretic or, athe- or missionary, you have to know what to answer them. Now here's a very important thing. Amar Yohanan, Komakom Shepakru Haminim Teshubatan Besidan. Any place that the heretics, the missionaries, and we have to understand, Christians could be great people. There are some Christians who are good people, friends of the Jews, no doubt. I'm not saying Christians are bad people. But what I am saying is, it's part of the doctrine of Christianity that they take our Torah and they twist it to show their religion through our text, which means if Christians just went and made their own testament without needing to make a new one and making ours the old one, if they would just leave us alone, have your own religion, what do you gotta mess up the hours for? That would be fine, do whatever you want. But what, they, what they're doing is they're so obsessed with the Old Testament, the Christians, that they have to go into our testament and try to find proofs of Jesus in our Torah. Why do they have to do this? It makes no sense. The reason why they have to do this, really, is because Rabbi Tobi Singer always says, and he's like on the forefront of missionaries, he says the number one issue that bothers Christians, like nothing else bothers them, is if it's so clear, Jesus is so clear as death, why do the Jews not believe in him? What is going on? Did they not get the memo? He was Jewish. He switched over. He didn't switch over. They say he switched over. We don't know what he did. He was dead by the time they, they said that. But what about the Jews? Why don't they believe in him? It makes no sense. They should be the ones who are the most believing in Jesus. Right? So what do they do? They go back into our Bible, which is they call the Old Testament, which is kind of an insult because there's nothing old about it. It's just the Testament to us. And they twist it and they say, here's a proof of Jesus here, and here's a proof of Jesus here, and they're going to come to you. So I always say this, and I, mean, I was talking to a couple of people yesterday at this table. I was approached tons of times by missionaries. I don't know about you guys. Maybe I just have that kind of a face. But I, literally. And they come to me and they ask me point blank, why have you not accepted Jesus? And you have to answer them. And they come to you with your own Torah. So number one, you have to learn your Torah so you have to know what to answer them. You have to know your own Torah because they know parts of the Torah better than us especially the prophets. Mm-hmm. We have to learn. And number two, we have to understand that they're twisting our words and how to answer them. So, I will, I'll talk about it in a second, actually. If I don't mention it, remind me. I want to talk about the Septuagint. Everybody, anybody here familiar with the Septuagint? Okay, so remind me in a couple of minutes. It's a good example of how they twist our words. So, the Bihana says you have to know what to answer them. But he says, guess what? Hashem did us a favor. Any place, komakom, where the minim, minim are the words, la minim la mashinim, we say in Amida. Minim are the heretics, right? Any place that the minim point to and say, aha, look at this verse. Is that not talking about Jesus? Teshuvatan betzidan. The answer is right there. Right there. In the, probably in the same pasuk. Or the next pasuk after. Or the pasuk right before it. Rabbi Victor Miller says, this is very important. Hashem did a kindness to us. Hashem said, I know they're going to be Bible critics and they're going to butcher your Torah right and left. The answers, you don't have to look too far. Go to that Pasuk, and this is so true because I'm telling you because I've done it and I've, I've delved into this, into the missionary world a little bit. Not the Pasuk so much, but I've delved into the text because it bothers me where they bring me proofs from my own prophets. It bothers me. And it's true. You read it. Just say, it. what's the Pasuk? Ezekiel 26? Okay, hold on one second. Read the Pasuk. You're going to find the answer right there. there. It doesn't last too long, what they're claiming. The answer is a word before. The answer is a word at. You know, there's a couple of examples. For example, and the Gemara over here brings a bunch of examples. Our, our Pirashah has a bunch. They always point to the fact where it says, Bereshit bara Elohim. 
In the beginning, God created. Elohim is a plural word. God, Elohim. It doesn't necessarily mean God. Rambam has a whole thing about the word Elohim. But we use it as God, right? But it's Elohim is plural, with the mem at the end. So they say, ah, there's gods. See? The third word of here, Torah, there's gods. Because it's Torah and Elohim. But the answer is, Beyom Asototo. Two words later, it says in the singular verse, He created. Or they'll go to when Hashem created man, the famous one, where Hashem says, Naase Adam Vesalmenu Kidmutenu. Let us create man in our image, in our likeness. Who is he talking to? His partners, right? This is what they answer. No, look at the Pasuk two seconds later, right? Hashem created Adam Bitsalmo in his image. So now the question is, why does he use plural there? Good question. Rambam talks about this. Open guide for the perplexed. First chapter and second chapter, you see a lot about all these things. But the answer to them is very, very close by. So it's something good to know. Whenever you hear this, just look at the pasuk. And if you have a question yourself, not that you're a heretic, God forbid, but if you read a pasuk and it makes zero sense to you, just read the pasuk. Read the pasuk before. Read the pasuk after. Hashem buried and hid the, the answer to the key right there. You don't have to look too far. It's a kindness Hashem did to us. Hashem put up the answer 10 chapters later. Rabbi Miller says, Hashem made a kindness. He said, I know people are going to mess up here and here and here. I'm going to put the answers right next to it. It'll be easy for you to just look. Just focus and you'll find it. Okay, that's number one. Let's do the Septuagint. We may as well. We're on topic. So, I said Bideshit is a place where a lot of people slip up. So, you, you know about the Septuagint. Does everybody here know about it? So basically, yeah, we all, okay, so basically, the, for those who don't, so the Christians, they have an English Bible now, right? Mm -hmm. But where did they get the English from? It wasn't given in English, even they believe that. So it was translated from the Greek. The English was translated from the Greek, right? Well, how did it get from Hebrew to Greek? So there's a story in the Gemara Megillah, I can read it to you then. Gemara Megillah says, it's a story with Talmai Hamelech. Talmai is like a Ptolemy in English with a P before it. The king of Egypt. Ma'asebe Talmai HaMelech. There's a story of Talmai HaMelech. Shekinesh shef'im u'shnayim zekenim. He brought in 72 rabbis. Ve'ichnisam b'shef'im u'shnayim batim. And he put them in 72 separate houses. Separate. Ve'log ilala hem al makinis kinsan. And he didn't tell them why they were being locked in separate places. Ve'ichnas esa kol ahad v'ahad. He went to each one of them privately. The Amalayim he told them, Write me the Torah of your master Moses in Greek. I want the Torah in Greek. It was never translated until this point. Hashem gave every one of the 72 rabbis a wisdom and an idea in their head. They all had the same idea. And they all had the same exact idea. And they all changed the Torah 15 times. Because they saw it was going to be a problem if this pasuk is translated literally. He's going to make that aha moment that he wants. So they all changed the Torah 15 times. Exactly the same words. All 72 rabbis changed it. Exactly the same words in all 15 locations. So that they don't get tripped up by this guy, Tom, by this king, Tom. And they're going to list the 15 changes. And I can tell you a couple of them if you want. But we're very short on time. By the way, we're not getting to everything I want to talk about today. It's just impossible. Bereshit is, is a C. So Septuagint is what the Christians claim is their oldest Bible in Greek, the oldest version, which gives them like validity. So they'll go to you and they'll be like, but in the Septuagint it says, I'll give you an example. In Isaiah and Ishaya, so we're jumping around, but it's okay. Um, we have this Virgin Mary story, right? I don't want to spend, everybody knows the Virgin Mary story, right? right. I, don't know how, I don't know how she got away with that, honestly. That would never fly for any other wife in any other, but she got away with it, that through the window, great story, and it worked for her, good for her. Um, so the, they say the Virgin gave birth. Now, they want to prove this in our Bible. Again, it's not enough for them to just have a story on their own. Now they got to go backwards in time to the Jewish Bible and find a verse that says, a virgin will give birth. They have to do this. So where do they go to? They go to the story of Yeshaya, Isaiah. But that's spending too much of my time. 
and it's limited today. Basically, there was a story that the king of Yehuda, of Yerushalayim, was being attacked by two other kings who joined forces against him. And he was frightened that he was going to be destroyed. Hashem told Yeshaya, uh, go to him and tell him you're not going to lose the war. Don't worry, they're not going to beat you. The king didn't believe. Hashem said, ask a sign and I'll prove to you that they're not going to beat you. The king didn't ask for a sign, which is not a good thing. It was actually a bad thing, but no time for this now. Remind me another time, I'll be happy to do it. And Hashem says, I'll give you a sign. And he tells Yeshaya, tell the king, behold, the Alma will give birth. The Alma will give birth. What's Alma? She will give birth to a son. You will name the son Emmanuel. 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 Emmanuel is a very Christian name, right? Emmanuel is a Christian name. This is why it's Christian. This is where it comes from. The Alma will give birth. You will name him Emmanuel. Emmanuel. And he will eat cream and honey. He will be grown up in luxury, which means you'll be okay. So you won't be destroyed. And by the time he knows how to choose between good and bad, the threat will be gone. This was the proof that Hashem gave to Isaiah. Now, what do the Christians do? They say the Alma, they translate it, open up King James Bible, they translate it as the virgin. Behold, the virgin will give birth. Alma doesn't mean virgin. Alma means young girl. We have the word Alma also by the Achel, when she brings out the water, which you could actually up from now. The, the Alma came out and brought water. Alma does not mean virgin. It means, uh, it means a young girl. And there's proofs for it. I'll give you one proof that I can't delve too much into because I'll talk the whole time about this, but you can do your homework on it. In Mishleh, uh, Shalomon HaMelech says, there are some things that are beyond his understanding. And in one of the Pesukim, he says, it's like a boat. Again, this is just Mishleh, so it's very hard to understand. It's, it's deep, but bear with me. Shalom Melech says, it's like a boat that goes into the sea. It's like a bird that soars in the sky. It's like an alam with a woman. Alam is a young man with a woman. Now, if he's talking about a virgin man, how could it be talking about a relationship? It's a proof that alam, the alam and alma is the same word. It doesn't mean virgin. It means a young person. So they distort our verse and they say, behold, the virgin will give birth. And they're talking about Emmanuel. So Emmanuel is another name for Jesus, even though that's happened way before. This is what they do. Has anybody ever heard this from a missionary before? Okay. God willing, you don't hear one. I don't talk to strangers. I talk to, you know what? My wife hates it, but I talk to strangers because I saw a couple actually on Chandler and they were going around and I, they didn't come over to me, but I actually called them over. And I said, you guys, are you guys missionaries? They said, yeah. I mean, they have the look of the missionary. If you see a nice, put together, white guy <laughs> with like hair brushed back and a suit, and he's not Jewish, he's a missionary. And he's got the books under his name. So I said, let me just talk to you for a few minutes. And I, and I asked him all sorts of questions. And then uh, he said, I don't know. I said, until you find the answers, I told you this. Said, don't talk to Jewish people, because they're coming after us, you should know. In Israel, it's unprecedented what's happening now. Constant. In Israel, it's unprecedented what's happening now. It's a big mistake where we think the Christians are not our enemies per se, but there are many Christians who have their goal in their life is to missionize Jesus, and they believe that Jesus will never come back until the Jews believe in Jesus. There are many Christians that believe this. So it's, yes, there are many that are friends and they love Israel, but a lot of them also, their goal in life is to missionize you. You should know this. So they'll do this, for example. So Septuagint, they call this version, so I'm talking about Talmai Amelech, the 72 kings, who, the 72 rabbis who translated into Greek. Septuagint became, this book became the Septuagint. Septuagint is Greek, it's for, for the word 70. 72, they were close, they were off by a couple. But the biggest, the biggest fake of this whole thing is the rabbis didn't translate not Isaiah. So they'll come to you and say, ah, the Septuagint says, that it means virgin, right? The rabbis didn't even, this story is only translated to Torah, not not. Isaiah didn't translate. So that's an, another fallacy. The Septuagint, they, they, if someone comes to you and says Septuagint now, it's not the same Septuagint of this one. They lost that one, it's way off. Okay, so let's go back, because we went way off into Christianity, which we do sometimes. Um, we're talking about the Torah, how Bereshit is a minefield. Bereshit is a minefield. 
You have to be able to navigate it because there's tons of questions, and this is where the Bible credits come. And I want to tell you something. For Hannah Leibowitz says, Hashem knew full well that when the Bible critics will come and see the Torah, and he put the word Naaseh, we will make men, Hashem knew full well that these people would look at this and say, here's a proof that there's pluralism, there's more than one God, yet he still did it. He, and why? That's a good question. Why did Hashem purposely put it? Hashem's not dumb. He knows that when he writes these in the Pesukim, it's going to open himself up to question. And he still did it, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Okay. So we have the beginning of it as sheep, seven days of creation. Just want to put it out there. So something to think about. Go to any country, any place in the world. How many days is there a week? Seven days. Jewish, not Jewish, Buddhist. Everyone has a seven day week. If there's no greater, there is no greater proof than creation to this. Why? Ask someone, why do you have a seven day week? Why? So now the truth is, not everyone always had a seven day week. There were civilizations, extreme communist civilizations, for example, like Russia once tried, to not have a seven day week. They tried a five day week. They say the ancient Greeks tried, tried a color coded week. There was a 10 day week they tried to get more labor. None of it worked. End of the day, we're all back to seven days. So you don't have to look forward more further than that for proof of creation. Now they'll tell you that there's seven planets in the sky, Saturn, and that's why Saturn is Saturday and all that. That's fine, but the bottom line is anywhere in the world right now, there's a seven day week. They believe in it, even if they say they don't believe in it. It's a seven day creation, just like our Torah says. Okay. I want to tell you something nice. I know you have to leave early, so I want you to hear this one. I want to tell you something. When we, this testifies to creation. When you say there were seven days, when you say today is Sunday, Yomani Shon, today is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, you are testifying that the world was created in seven days. It's very powerful. Don't undermine what you're doing. When you testify that there's a seven day week, you're literally giving testimony, like in court, that God created the world. And we do this on Shabbat night when we say Kiddush. When we say Kiddush, Shabbat night, how do we start Kiddush, Shabbat night, anyway? Yom HaShishi, Baichulva Shemayim Ve'adus. Now, question for you. How does the Pasuk go? What are the first words of that Pasuk? Yom HaShishi? It's a Pasuk. Is a pasuk. We start Kiddush this way, right? How does the Pasuk go? Can we know the Pasuk by heart? I'll read you. I'm going to read you two Pesukim. Vayad Elohim et kol asher asa, on the sixth day, Hashem saw everything, that everything he did. Be'ine tov me'od was good. Vayar ere vayi bokeh yom hashishi. End of Pasuk. It was evening and it was morning the sixth day, Yom HaShishi, end of Pasuk, end of Pasuk, next Pasuk. How do we start Kiddush? Yom HaShishi. Yom HaShishi. Yom HaShishi. We're starting with the two words from the last Pasuk. Why are we starting Kiddush in the middle of the Pasuk? The Pasuk starts, The last two words of the last Pasuk are Yom HaShishi. Why in the world do we start our Kiddush with two words from the last Pasuk? Is there a reason for this? There's two reasons for this. Another question. Why do we stand up Friday night for Kiddush? Do we sit down Shabbat morning for Kiddush? What's the difference? And so Halakha is as follows. Like I just said. When we say Vaitul Lashamaya which means on the seventh day Hashem finished the whole world, we are testifying that Hashem created the world. Like I said, don't take it lightly. You're saying, Hashem, I am saying that you created the world and it wasn't the Big Bang Theory. Or maybe you made the Big Bang Theory. Fine, you can say that. There's a, there's a law in the Torah that witnesses in court have to stand up when they give testimony. And so when you give your testimony Friday night, that Hashem created the world, you stand up for your testimony. The Rama, the Ashkenaz commentary to the Ashkenaz, he says, just stand up for the words, 
Yom Hashishi Vatu Hashamah. Then you can sit down. The halacha is you don't really have to stand up for the whole paragraph. The main part to stand up for is the testimony part. You're giving testimony. And this is why when the men, we, we do this in shul. On Friday night after the Amidah, we read this in shul. We go home, we do it again. Why do we do it again? For you. We do it for the women. Because every single person in our family should be testifying Hashem created the world, not just us. Now, back to the other question. That's why we stand up Friday night. Good? Some, some stand up and then sit down. Some right, like I, right, that's why I said, Ashkenaz Ramad, the Ashkenaz said, you, you stand up for the word, and, and, right? and, then, and, and then, then you sit. Why that? Why that? Why does the Ramad say that? Why can you sit down after those four words? And the first question, why do we start from the words Yom Hashishi, which is the two leftovers from the previous lesson? And there's two answers. When we want to give testimony to Hashem, we want to invoke His name. Hashem's name of Yud Ke Vav Ke. It's not here. It's the name Elohim is here, but not Yud Ke Vav Ke. Yom Hashishi, the first letter of each word. Yom Yud Hashishi He Vaykulu Vav Hashemayim He Yud He Vav Ke. We bring these two words of Yom HaShishi because we want Hashem's name to be in here. And you stand up, according to the Ramah, out of respect for Hashem's name. Once you said those four words, Ashkenazim, well, you can sit down. There's another reason, which is more Kabbalistic. There's a very famous name of Hashem, which is the name of 72. 72 letters, Ayin Shem, Ayin Bet. Very deep Kabbalistic meanings. If you count the letters of the Kiddush, you're going to see 35 letters in the Vaifulu. And you're going to see 35 letters in the Berachah of the Kiddush. That's 70. We would love two more to get 72. So we add the Yom HaShishi. It's another reason the Ali does it. So therefore, we have something to think about Friday night when we do Kiddush. When we do Kiddush, and we're, if you have kids at home like us, come out to the table yelling, everyone's hectic, set the table, put the cups. But think for a second before Kiddush. I'm about to testify that the creator of the world created the world in seven days. And this is the greatest thing you can do. The seven-day week shows you believe in God. It's as easy as that. And so before we do Kiddush, we think, why am I starting Yom Shishi? Because I'm invoking Hashem's name. Yom HaShishi Vashiyosh Shemayim Ve'ahaz Ve'ahaz It gives you extra meaning for your Kiddush. Okay. Let's try to go. This is going to be a weird class, honestly. It's going to be strange. It already is strange. Because I can't have one theme that I do all, because that's what is beta sheet is massive. So I'm just going to try to hit on a few points. Have a nice day. I'm going to try to hit on a few points and see if, if any of these things work out. Let's start from day one. Beta sheet parai lehima to shamayim beta adis. In the beginning, Hashem created. What I want to do here is I want to try to maybe give you a couple of nuggets that maybe was right in your face and maybe you didn't see, maybe you did see, I'm not insulting anybody. But I think there's a lot here that's right in front of our faces that maybe we just skip over. In the first pasuk in the Torah, in the beginning Hashem created the heavens and the earth. Okay? I'm gonna to go to day two now. Hashem called the upper firmament heavens. One second, heavens was day one. Was heaven's day one or day two? So Rabbi Miller explains day one was outer space. When it says, that's outer space, the galaxies. And on day two, he created our sky as we know it, as we know it. Two separate things. That's literally right in our face. Heaven was created on two separate days, or two different heavens. Something to think about is the galaxy as we know the universe is massive. But well, look what the Torah does. It says Hashem created the galaxies and the earth, the heavens and earth, and then all of a sudden it focuses on the earth only. What about all the amazing galaxies, right? What does NASA do all day long? They're trying to ex explore all the amazing far end places. But the Torah narrows its focus. Like, look at the story. It introduces us to this huge background, and then all of a sudden, sorry universe, you're done. You got one word. The whole universe got one word. I'm going to talk about the land only. Adis. And then Adis, Adam, and then Abraham. It narrows its focus only on what's important to the Torah. And if you feel unimportant, read this. 
Hashem literally created the Milky Way galaxy, all the planets, all the stars, and he gives them one word, and then he says, let's focus on what really counts, Earth. Earth is what counts. All of this was for us. Everything was for us. If you invite someone to a party, a VIP, a guest of honor to a dinner, who comes first to the dinner, the waitresses or the VIP? The waitresses come first. They set up the table first, they cook the food first, they put the cups and the plates in the course, and then when everything's ready, in comes the VIP. That was us. Hashem said, I'm setting the whole world up for you. That's why Adam was last. Adam was the most important part of creation. That's why we say, That's why there was only one person created. Why didn't Hashem just make a few of us, a few Adams, and a few Havas, a few men? Why only one? Bishpilin Olam. Hashem created the world for one guy. You're one guy. You're not different. You're one guy. This is the lesson of creation. Now, I mentioned before, Hashem knows that the Baba critics are going to try to tear this apart, and he did it anyway. So the author of the author of Sabakta says, Rashi says, why did Hashem said, let us make men, in plural? Now, this is when I've said this a hundred times from Rabbi Tversky, and I love it. So I'll just say it very quickly. I love it. Let us make men. Who is he talking to? Who was he talking to? The angels? Rabbi Tversky brings down the classic answer. He was talking to men. Let us make you into a man. Right now you're an animal. It takes all of us to make ourselves into men, into humans. We are born with instincts like babies. Look at a baby. How is a baby any different than an animal? And then it's a journey for us to become human beings. So Hashem says to us, let us make you into a man. Now the job is on you. It's your job to make yourself into a man. And we have people who are older, and there are still little babies, and they're still animalistic. They're not men, right? A man is someone, what is the, what is the difference between a man and an animal? The ability to defer, besides talking, the ability, ability to defer pleasure. That's the difference. An animal sees something, he goes after it, finishes. You never saw an animal say, I would really love that dog food, but I'm on a diet and it's bad for my figure, right? It's not gonna work. An animal sees pleasure and goes after pleasure. Only a human being can defer pleasure for a greater good. You're hurting yourself. Why don't you want to eat it? Because it's better for me. Or it's more spiritual for me to sacrifice myself to make that person happy. Only humans can do this. So let us make men. It's all of our jobs to make ourselves into men. Very important lesson. Also opposable thumbs. Thumbs, yes, also the thumbs. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, so the author of Slovakia says, that she says, Hashem was talking to the angels, obviously. This is the basic understanding. Let us make man. Why is he asking the angels? Because Hashem was teaching us to have a little humility. Even if you can run the whole show on your own, ask people for help, ask people for advice. It's a Musa lesson for us. So the author of Slovakia says to us, look at this. Hashem knowingly put a mind field in his Torah, knowing that people are going to claim that he's not the only God just to teach us a little lesson. What's more important to Hashem? His own pride or personal growth for us? Growth for us is more important. Hashem says, Deret eres kadma la Torah. I need to teach you a lesson from example, how you don't do it all by yourself. You ask for advice, you be humble. And therefore I'm gonna put in my Torah, na'ase adam let us, even though I'm exposing myself and people are going to say, I'm not the only God. There was a partner with me. I'll take that risk. I'll take that loss. Because it's worth it for me to teach you this lesson. It's something important. Musad, personal growth, it comes before the Torah. It's more important than the Torah. And by Torah scale, he says, I've said this, Mrs. Adal, you've heard this before for sure. Uh, Rabbi Torah says, go to an ingredient list. You want to make a cake or something, a new, a new dish. And it says, on the top of the list, it says, ingredients you will need. That's the stuff you have to buy. And on the bottom, it says what to do. So he says, it's interesting, because he's looked at ingredient lists, and they say flour, sugar, oil, water, and... But a guy can buy all those things, bring it home, and he doesn't have an oven to cook it in. And he'll be like, it's not fair. Why don't you put oven on the list? How come oven is not on the list? I need an oven to cook. But you won't see oven on any of the ingredient lists. Right? Why? 
because the oven is this. If you don't have an oven, you're not even in the realm of cooking. An oven is so assumed. Don't even try unless you've got the oven already. The same thing Rabbi Millet or Rabbi Yitorsky says is with midot and character traits. Why doesn't Hashem put a misvah in the Torah? You shall become a nice person. That's the oven. The Torah is a recipe. All the things Hashem gave us is a recipe to, to make ourselves a beautiful dish. If you don't have an oven, if you don't have the midot, you're, you're not even in the picture. It's assumed. It doesn't even belong on the list. It's before the list. Rabbi Miller always says, the number one mitzvah is the mitzvah of common sense and human decency. That's the number one mitzvah. It's so much of a mitzvah that it's not one of the mitzvah. It's before the mitzvah. And that's this idea. So Hashem exposed himself because dedicated is come out of Torah. How much time we have left? You've got uh, 10 minutes or more. Oh boy. Okay. Now let's get to the story of Adam and Hava eating the, eating the fruit, which everyone loves. So number one. Let's just talk about the name Adam for one second. I'm going to be jumping everywhere. This is going to be a very odd day today. I'm going to be jumping everywhere. Adam. Hashem named him Adam. Why? Adam. Because he came from the Adama, from the earth. From the earth. Adam, it's a big mistake to think, which I know we don't, but some do. It's a big mistake to think that Adam was this like archaic caveman type person because we don't hold this at all. It's not evolution. We hold that Adam was lofty and we're going down as the ages go on. Adam was so immensely great. He was created by God himself. He had the most amazing intellect you could imagine. And yet Hashem was his father. Hashem had to name him Adam just to remind him that he's a person. When you, when you name someone something, it's a reminder. For example, Moshe Rabbeinu, he named his son Gedeshom. Right? Because Hashem kicked me out of my land. I'm not with my brothers anymore. Why did he do that? It's just not, not a cute name. The name is a reminder. Every time you say the name, it reminds you of something that you're trying to remember. Adam was named Adam. Hashem was saying, every time you see your name, when you think about your name, remember, you're amazing. You look, and you're in my Salem, you're in my image, you're in the image of God, but you're not God. Remember who you are. It humbles you. And guess what? Adam did the same thing. He learned the same lesson from Hashem. When did Hava get her name? Eve. I don't know why it's Eve. No. It should be Ava. Hava, Ava, no? I, I, when did Eve get her name? Not right away. She didn't get her name Hava, Eve, Ava, until after the sin with the snake. What does Hava mean in Aramaic? Havia in Aramaic is snake. Havia in Aramaic is snake. Adam got the lesson. Hashem named me Adam to remind me where I come from and to keep me grounded. Hava, I'm now naming you Hava because remember the snake tripped you up. Remember it. Havia in Aramaic is snake. Now Adam, it's interesting Hashem chose the name Adam because yes, man is created from earth, but there are four elements to all matter. Right? Earth, wind, fire, and earth. Earth, wind, fire, and water. Uh, water. 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 But the Balatanya, he says, if you want to know the core of an item, what is the main, the main uh, ingredient of a thing? Destroy the thing. If you destroy the thing, what's left? The main component can never be destroyed. If you take a tree and you burn the tree, the water in the tree is gone. The wind in the tree is gone. What else do we have? The earth stays. The fire is gone when it goes out, and the earth stays behind. The ash is the earth. When you burn a tree, you get ashes. When anything burns, we get ashes. That shows you what the primal ingredient of that thing was. It can never be destroyed. If you burn ashes, it'll just still be ashes. Right? You can't burn ashes. The primal ingredient in something can never be destroyed. So Adam would give Adam, because yes, there's four elements, but the earth is the primal one. When, I, when Abraham said, 
and Hashem later on. Anochi afad ba'efen, Hashem, I am dirt and ash. We look at it as he's being very humble. He was being very humble. But you know, he was also telling Hashem, he's saying, Hashem, I am important. I am the earth of creation. I am the primal matter of creation, which means you can destroy everything. I'm still sticking around. I'm the ash. So the ash is something, it's not nice, it's not glorious, it's the leftovers of, of destruction. But at the same time, simultaneously, it, it connotes the, the thing that can't be destroyed. So Adam, uh, when Abraham said, Anuhi afar ba'efet, I am dirt and ash. Yes, I'm nothing, I'm humble, but Hashem also, I'm everything. I'm the main ingredient, it's all for me. I'm the earth, I can't be destroyed. And if you destroy it, I'm what's left over. Interesting thought. This Gemara that says, I love this Gemara. Gemara Menachot says, Hashem created the world with his names, Yud and He, or Hashem's letters of his last name, of his name. The next world is with the Yud, and this world is created with the He, or He for the Ashkenazim. I'm going to say He. So He is He. So the Gemara says, Menachot. Gemara says, This, this is Pirashat. It's chapter 2, Pasuk 4. These are the generations of the, of the heavens and the earth. When he created them. Interesting word. Very famous Gemara Menachot says. You know what this word means? Break the word in half. Hashem created the earth with the letter He. What does this mean? Yemelah says, You should read the word with the letter He, Hashem created the world. Why did Hashem create the world with the spiritual qualities of a He? Because the He is like this, right? The He has a roof, goes down, and a little leg here. The bottom of the He is empty. Hashem created the world behe, which means with free choice. You have the, cho cho the choice to choose good or evil. And if anyone wants to choose evil, they can drop right down. Behe has a roof, but it has no floor. So Hashem is saying, look at the world. There's a hay. You can drop right down the middle. You gotta watch out. Because if, you, if you're not careful, you can drop all the way down and loop out of the letter, out of the world, so to speak. Okay, that's what the Gemara says. So then, therefore, the Gemara says, Why couldn't you have a Dalit? It also has no floor. Why did you have to have the head, the little thing at the end? The head like this? Why do you have that, that little leg? Why is that necessary? The Gemara says, Because a person can do Teshuvah. Hashem created the invention of Teshuvah we talked about before the holiday. You can go in, so you fell through the bottom of the head. You can go in and around, right through the shortcut, right above that little leg. The Gemara says. So again, Hashem created the world with the A, because you can drop down. So then what's the purpose of this little leg here? Because there's a little opening here. So in other words, it could have been a Dalid, or it could have been a Hayat. A Hayat is fully closed. Why does the hay have a little opening on the top there? So you can go around and come right back in. You go right back into the game by doing Teshuvah. Gemara says, why can't the guy just go back up the way he fell? Right? Gemara says, Lo amilta. It's not going to work. You can't go back up the way you fell. Interesting lesson. So in other words, like this. It doesn't mean, so we have to think spiritually. Hashem created the world in the concept of a hand. Free choice, like I said. You can drop down if, you, if you're not careful. Hashem also created the world with this element of Teshuvah. This magic of Israel we spoke about, the magic of Tishula. Which means once you drop down, Hashem is coming right back in. You can't go back at the same time. A person goes on business trips to Vegas, for example, <coughs> once a month. And every time the guy goes to Vegas, what happened in Vegas stayed in Vegas. And he came home, and it was a very bad situation, right? The person says, I want to do Tishula. I want to fix my ways. I got to go to Vegas tomorrow. Are you crazy? 
You can't go back to being. Right? You have to find, sometimes we trick ourselves, we trick our consciences. We do this with diets all the time. Um, exhibit A, diets. It's impossible, right? I want to lose weight. By the way, can I have pancakes for breakfast? Right? We, we say we want to change our ways, but then we just want to go right back, back up the same path we fell down. You have to create a new path. It's simple, but it's powerful. My chance is go around and just find a new road. Change the road of life. Change the road of drop. This is Tishul Vav. Sometimes, sometimes we delude ourselves. When you ask a guy, you want to have, it's a new year now. New Year's resolution, what did you change? You change one thing in your day. Change one minute. Instead of doing this, you do that. Make a small, tiny change, a real change, because you can't go back to the same path. It's not going to work. That's the lesson of that. I'm jumping around. We have very short on time. Okay. The fruit in the garden. Hashem created Gan Eden. Eden means delightful pleasure. Rabbi Miller calls in his books Gan Eden, the garden of delight, we call it. Not garden, garden of Eden. That's the Hebrew. Translated, the garden of delight. It's a great word, I love it. The garden of delight. Hashem puts how many trees in the garden of delight? Two trees. Let's read the Pasuk. He puts over here, He puts all the, I'm in chapter 2, uh, verse 9, that's what it says. He puts all the good fruit, the tree of life in the middle, according to some commentaries, inside or in the middle, mamash in the middle of the garden, the tree of life, and also the tree of knowledge. So, I don't know about you, but I, 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 I think people don't realize there's two separate trees. Even like learned people, like there's two separate trees. There's a tree of knowledge and a tree of life. It's not the same tree. Okay. Habet Hayim says there's a lesson here automatically. Where did he put the tree of life? Betoch Hagan. In the middle of the garden. And where did he put the tree of knowledge? It doesn't say. The Pasuk says, the tree of life in the middle of the garden. And the tree of knowledge, somewhere. We're not sure where it was. Habet Chaim says the tree of life in the garden of Eden, the garden of delight, and the tree of life in this world, you want to earn life in the next world, is in the middle. It's exactly in the middle, which means no one has a shorter path to it than anyone else. You have the same exact access to the tree of life as every other person in this world. Doesn't matter if you grew up not religious, not Jewish, but that person's a rabbi's son. You have the same exact path. Everyone has a different path. It's not one path to the, it's not in the corner. The tree of life is not in the corner where you have to take this road to get to it or one of three roads. It was exactly in the middle. Something that's exactly in the middle can get, you can get there any way from the circumference, any way. There's a million different paths and they're exactly the same distance. Prophet Haim says every single person can get to the tree of life. Don't think it's too far. It's exactly in the middle. There's different ways to get to it. Everyone has their own way. Okay. So they eat the fruit. What was the fruit? I said on, I spoke on Sukkot and I said the opinion that some say it would be a drug. For anyone who was here on Sukkot, the Targum, the Umkilos, you look at the word Umkilos, he says, uh, I think Umna Dad, the same shortage of the word Etrog. Some people say it would be Etrog, the citrus tree, citron tree, sorry. Some say it was a fig, some say it was a grape, some say it was wheat, whatever it was. It was not an apple, for sure. He puts the two trees there, and he commands him what? You can eat all the trees, but the tree of knowledge, of good and bad, you can't eat. What about the other tree? Can I eat it? The tree of life. There's no prohibition. Yeah. Why? Because once he ate the tree of knowledge, Hashem doesn't want him to eat the tree of life. We fast forward after the story when he sinned, Hashem says, uh-oh, he's going to eat the tree of life. i got to get him out of here. So he didn't want him to eat the tree of life. So why was he not prohibited to eat it before? And the answer is very simple, actually. Before the sin, there was no death in the world. There was no death. 
I'm not going to a vegetarian. Human, we're, humans were created vegetarians. There's no death. There's no killing anything. Nothing died. Death was created once the sin happened. So if Adam wanted to eat the Eitz HaChayim, he could eat the Eitz HaChayim, whatever. He's going live forever anyway. Once death had to come into this world because of the sin, Hashem says, no, now you have to die. You cannot eat the Eitz HaChayim. It was previously there for the taking. Now I have to kick you out because you can't have it. Notice that. The prohibition is only on the tree of knowledge. Now I want to tell you something from the Rambam. Rambam in the Modena Bukhim, in the Guide for the Perplexed, in the beginning, is a very interesting thing. He says, as we know the story, I don't think I have to recap it, the snake gets Adam to eat it, the snake gets the uh, Haba to eat the fruit, and uh, she gives it to her husband, and they eat it, and then what happens, their eyes open, they see that they're naked, they hide, they get punished, they're kicked out of the garden and eat. Okay. Rambam says, he says as follows, he says, a wise person asked me a question. My mom says this, a wise person asked me and said, why would it be that Adam Adishon got rewarded for his sin? Because he ate the forbidden fruit, his eyes were open, he got all this extra knowledge, he realized he was naked, he didn't know that before. Why would he gain from his sin? My mom says, you have it all wrong. It's a good question, you have it all wrong. It's very important to know the difference between true and false, good and bad. Those are two very different things. True and false, I'll use Rambam's words. Rambam says as follows, this is exactly what his example was. Rambam says, if someone were to say to you that the earth is round, would you say good? Or would you say true? It's not good, it's true. And it says, if someone says to you, the earth is flat, would you say, bad? No. You would say, false. Adam had shown us created before the creation of opinions. We live in the age of opinions right now. How many truths are out there? There's apparent truths, there's half-truths. Everyone has their own truth. We don't even know what the word true means anymore these days. Or fact. Facts. Well, alter facts, right? Uh, uh, is a fact a fact or not? When Adam and shown us created, there were true and false. There was, no, there was no room for opinion. Something's true or something's false. Not good and bad. And that's why, look at the words of the Pasuk. The Eitz Hada'at Tov Vara, Rambam says. The, the, the fruit of the tree that gives you the knowledge of good or bad. Opinions of, of morality. It doesn't say Rambam says, et hada'at sheked ve'emet. That's what Rambam says. Rambam says this. It doesn't say the, the tree that knows falsehood from truth. Adam and Eshon didn't gain knowledge by eating the fruit. He lost knowledge. His true and false ability to determine true and false became clouded by all this opinion of right or wrong morally. You understand what I'm saying? Rambam says, with the tree of knowledge of good and evil, what it did was it introduced to him apparent truths, opinions, the snake said do this. It clouded his vision. He did not benefit from this. He was always naked. It doesn't say he became naked afterwards. Rambam says, it says, but he pakachna in him. Hashem opened his eyes and he now, he always saw that he was naked. But what was naked? Was it good? No, it wasn't good or bad. It was true. Nothing wrong with that. Now it became an opinion, is it good or bad to be naked? And he closed. Adam Elishon went down. He was created with true and false things, black or white. And now, he, after the age of truth, Rambam says, all these opinions came into effect. Something very interesting to think about when it comes to the sin and what the, uh, what the sin did to us. And we're still now battling our way between true and false and good and bad and it's subjective instead of objective. It's all up to someone's opinion and we're, 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 we're wading our way through it in the Galut now because we're in a world of it's not clear because of the sin. Bum bum. How much time do we have left now?
Oh, uh, five more minutes? Five more minutes, nice. Is that, is that okay? Yeah, one more. That'll be an hour. Yeah, one more, one more. <laughs> okay, one, one last one, just to continue this. Vatipa kahna in Ishinehem. After they eat it, there's so much in Bereshi. I didn't even talk about kain or hevel at all. No kain and no hevel. Vatipa kahna in Ishinehem. After they eat it, they realize that their eyes, their eyes open. But the doesn't mean it's a weird word. Pikea in Hebrew is like a smart, wise person. Their eyes were open, and they saw they were naked. We have this word in in, in the Sefer Bereshit again by Hagad. When Hagad took Ishmael, when Sarah kicked Hagad out of the house with Ishmael. And they went into the desert, and the kid was starving and thirsty. And she started crying. And the angel said, why are you crying? Hashem had mercy on her. Hashem opened her eyes and saw, oh, there's a well of water right there. There's water. It wasn't created. Just like the nakedness wasn't created. It was always there. Hashem just revealed you. Sometimes we can literally have a, a sheet on our eyes. It's right in front of our face. We don't see it. So Hashem opens it. Same thing with Hagar. The water was right there, but Hashem has to decide she's able to see it. And because of this, there's a lot, there's a midrash that says, and a lot of people do this, when you lose something, and you're trying to find it, some people have this saying, and they say, it's a midrash, Amad Avi Bin Yamin, Hakor Bechizka, I'll translate it. Hakor Bechizka Tshumin, Ad Sheba, Kadosh Baruch Hu, Bekeach, and Hemshel Yisrael. It's a midrash. This midrash goes on in the story of Hagar. Rabbi Binami says, Amal Rabbi Binami, Rabbi Binami says, Hakol Bechizkatsumin, everyone is blind. Everyone is considered blind. Ad Shifa, Kadosh Baruch until Hashem opens your eyes, Bobokeh, and the Hem Shali Sail, and lets you see. This is a real sigula, some people say when they try to find something. I've done it myself a bunch of times. You try to, you lost something, you try to find it. They say, Amal Rabbi Binami, Hakol Bechizkatsumin, Ad Shifa, Kadosh Baruch Hu, Bobokeh, and Hem Shali Sail. So it's an interesting thought about that. I'm tempted to do more, but I think it's times. I think time's up. It's a shame. Do you want to summarize? Or? Yeah, let's summarize. Okay. Today we were hopping all over the place. <laughs> Number one, remember, there's questions all over Bereshit, and there's questions in the Torah. The answers are right there. Remember, I took a singer, I quoted him before. He always says, if anyone comes to you with a claim, Ezekiel 53. Tell the guy, let's just read Ezekiel 52 first. 52. Let's go back one plus one. You'll find the answer right there. The Septuagint is a bunch of garbage. We spoke about this. The 72 rabbis, they translated it. Septuagint is nothing. Seven days testifies that Hashem created the world. So we have something to do Friday nights now. It's very heavy. When we do Kiddush Friday night, Yom Hashishi, why are we starting with these two words? Because we want to make Hashem's name, we stand up out of respect. Yom Hashishi, Vakuru Hashemayim. The men come home, we did it in shul, we do it again for the kids and for the women and for every single person in the house. We testify Hashem created the world. Hashem said, Na'ase Adam, let us make man, even though he exposed himself to attacks, just to teach us a lesson in humility. Remember I told you about the oven, the oven is not on the ingredient list because Derek Ed is Kadmala Torah. It's more important. Adam, we said, the word Adam is from Adama, it's from dirt. Remember, we are dirt and it's humbling. But also, if you destroy something, the ashes remain forever. So we're humble, but we're eternal as well. We're the main ingredient. What else? Behe Bare'am. Behe Bira'am. Hashem created the world with the letter He. <laughs> which means you can drop down, but you can always come back. But when you come back, go a different path. Don't go the same path. And the last thing is from the Hafez Hayim. The Etz Hayim Betoch Adam. The tree of life is in the middle of the garden, exactly in the middle, which means every single person has the same distance path to get to the life of the world to come. Have a great day, and thank you for bearing with us for Tereshav Tereshit.